Hi, everyone. Um, really glad to be back here in, in Oslo and on NDC. Uh, it was my first conference ever, uh, or developer conference. Uh, and I remember uh, it, all the sessions blew my mind. I, I, I learned so much that year. Um, so it's a big honor for me. I'm very humbled to stand here on stage yet again on NDC to speak to you guys. So um, this talk, or the underlying for foundation for this talk started about one, one and a half years ago. Uh, I, got an, I got the privilege to uh, work with the, one of the biggest newspapers in Sweden. So, and I started in the, in the so-called TV team, or where it's uh, video on demand and live video. So we did a web, web pitch for that. So, and they have the outspoken way that they should be working data-driven and um, and we worked, so every feature we did, we tried to A-B test. So one of the first assignments we got was, was like, oh, we're gonna re we need to rebuild this, this portal, this old, old piece of, of portal. It, it looked something like this. And uh, when you clicked in, it looked like this. So it's, it's black, it's, it's very messy. So, so we kept working, and I think it took a couple of months, and then we, we ended up in something what we thought was much, much, much nicer that looks something like this. So it's much cleaner, easier to find your information, uh, and everything, new features. So who here think that the new version did better than the old black version? So who, who here think the, the white version, version did best but with the users? So who here think the black version did best? Okay, yeah, so we have a 50-50. So the good thing here is you're both wrong because they actually did, there was no user behavior difference at all. So the user didn't notice more or less if we looked at the numbers, like for the new, new black site or the, the white, the new one. So it did nothing. So like three months of work and nothing. And of course, uh, a designer um, came up and said like, oh, I want to try three new play buttons. So you, you can see here in the site we have, so this is the new play button and here is like here we don't have that many play buttons. But we have wanted to add a play button. So we had three versions here. So who here thinks like the blue version won? Nobody? Okay. So the red version? Okay. And uh, what I call the Captain America version? Okay, so we have most, most votes on the red version. So the fun thing here is that we actually saw uh, like a 5% increase when we're using the red button. And we actually saw a decrease when we used the blue button. So in this case, just a small change to actually have a 5% uh, increase in, in, uh, in user, in this case, the, the number of video views, so the number of times they watch, watch, watch videos. So, and this concludes, like, the summary of all this and all these talks is this. So assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. So the things we assume that this should work, like, oh, we do all this work, change the design, and we have, like, no results. And we change this small thing, and we get big results. So there is no correlation, the, like, how much work we do and the result it actually has on the site. And so I hope this will be the theme of the talk. So who am I? Um, I'm a, I'm, I want to call myself a holistic developer because I do more or less everything. So I, I've been doing everything from DevOps stuff like Docker to uh, backend stuff like .NET and JavaScript on Node.js. And, uh, and recently I moved to more like uh, front-end stuff and React Native as well. So I do more or less everything in the developer space. And I also have a keen interest in like uh, processes and how teams works and, and, and things like that as well. But more than that, uh, in my spare time, I actually do a lot of self-experimentation. So about like five years ago, I bought a, bought a scale. And every, time, every morning I wake up, I, I, I stand on the scale, and I actually do A-B testing on myself. So one, one thing I did, I actually uh, tried to lose weight. So every Sunday I went out for a 10K run. Uh, so, and I, I read a report somewhere saying like, if you run shorter but more intensive, you will have the same effect as running the 10K. So I actually started running 2Ks, and, but much more intensive. And actually, it, the, the article was true, so I actually, actually lost the same weight as I did the, the, the weeks before when I ran, ran 10 Ks. So I actually do these kind of things even on myself on my spare time. 
And I think the latest thing I've actually tested was my lactate levels. So I actually, when I ran, I actually took blood tests to see how my, my uh, like lactate uh, um, goes in, the, in my blood. So I need to do more tests to see if my training is getting better or worse. So this talk, this talk is something, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I want to, to coin it A-B test driven development. So this is the core of the talk. So it's not just about A-B testing, it's about developers using A-B testing the same way we use test driven development. So the same way you actually write a test, instead you write a hypothesis. Uh, and then, of course, you write some code and you're, you try out your, uh, see if your test is red or green. And here, in this case, you actually evaluate your A-B test and see if it has a significant change or not. And the reason for this is this. We want to do the right thing. So TDD is actually focused on doing the things right. So your co code should be working, your, the, the code is written in a good way and stuff like that. But if it doesn't do the right thing, how much time you either put in it, it's still useless for the user or the people using your system. So and it's a problem doing the right thing. Of course, like we think like we get experience, we have like business analysts, we have UX developers, sorry, UXers. We have a lot of, lot of people trying to help us figuring out like what's, how do we do the right thing for our users. But it, there's, it's, a, it's a lot of problems with this because we have a lot of biases. So if you just ask one person, like, how should I do this? Or it, it's, it comes down to all our, this like quirks we have in our brain where we think and do stuff. So like the most common one is confirmation bias. So we actually, we actually select information that confirms our beliefs. And that's actually pretty dangerous if you want to make decisions based for your business, so to speak. And there are other things like anchoring and and of course, there is one for A-B testing as well. I think it's called like Berkinson's paradox uh, that we misinterpreted statistical experiments. So we have a we have a biases for that as well. So, but this the goal with this is actually to like try to counter all these biases that we have. So, so the big question here is like, what is an A-B test? So actually, of course, I Google this, trying to find um, as my confirmation biases uh, uh, a description that fits my my model. So I'm going to read this out loud. Two versions are compared, which are identical except for one variation that might act, affect a user's behavior. So there are some very important words in this. Um, and this is the three. So it's two versions, of course. We need to have a, what is called a variation and a control group. And of course, we want to affect the user behavior here. So we don't, uh, we, we don't, we're not interested in like how much server load there is, or how our servers are going, or how fast our computations are. So it's the user's behaviors that we're interested in changing. And then the, the scary part comes, and it's might, because everything, or like I would say, like 80, it's an 80-20 rule. Like 80% of the things we A/B test actually has no, no effect at all at, for the user. Uh, so most things we actually do is has nothing, will not in any way affect the user behavior. But the fun thing is when we actually find the, the gems that actually change. So it's the might part. And the reason for this is, so yeah, so there are other things in play here, just more than our biases, and that's that we are have a tendency to be fooled by randomness. So when we do the, these kinds of things, like check the user data, we actually have a, have a tendency to be fooled by, like, Oh, it was a rainy day, so people didn't go. I worked for uh, f for selling like um, flights, so if the summer is rainy, we actually the, the sa sales will go up. If it's sunny, it will go down. So depending on factors that are random, uh, your numbers will be random, um, and and that's a very normal way. And this, the same thing is if we just pick users up like a very uh, and check them, uh, it's easy to just get random numbers that we can't do anything with. And of course, this is a competitive edge because, like all, I, I'm guessing we have heard all like this. Uh, I would call them urban legends, but I'm guessing they are real. Like where Google tests uh, buttons and they have like ten different shades of blue and see which which one actually is better for make people making a buy. And I think all like the big companies actually are working in this kind of way. Uh, and for every time you improve your system, even if it's just one percent each time it will ac accumulate over time, and it will grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So the, for the 1% you add on top of that, it will be become exponentially growing. 
So this is an extremely competitive edge to have. Um, and the, the big paper, of course, I worked with, they had a competition with another big newspaper in Sweden. And the, the main thing was there is like to beat them. So every, every percentage counts. And of course, um, if you're working with a, like, the new cool agile ways, you want autonomous teams, teams that work, um, uh, do, yeah, works for themselves without having supervision. And um, I, I would say like a, doing A-B testing or having to have the user data behavior is a prerequisite, uh, or like you have to do it if you want real uh, autonomous teams. So like it's um, a lot of people are missing that part. So you say to a team like, yeah, here you have a designer, you have a developer, you have everything you need, uh, but here you like go and work in this dark box so you can't know what's happening around you. So if you, if you want a team to really make their own decisions, in choosing their like what to develop or what to do and do it in the right way, you really need to have this in place. And this also gives us the, the power to question why we do things that we do. A lot of things we do are like, yeah, we did them because like the last guy did that, did that way. Uh, or we have always had this feature here uh, because uh, we had it in the first version. So we can actually start to questioning everything we have in our system, even if they've been there a long time. Uh, and of, of course, it can sometimes show that like, like we have them there for a reason because it gives us more sales or more clicks or, or what we want. And of course, it enables us to make better decisions, uh, more non-biased decisions, more objective decisions uh, that hopefully are better for us and better for, for our users. So, <clears throat> so it, it all starts with a hypothesis. So we want to, uh, we have some kind of idea on what we want to do. And I've, of course, I've, uh, I've Googled this to like, how should a, a hypothesis be built? And of course, academia has their, their take on it. But like the short end version I found was this. So if I do something, then the users should buy more uh, due to the red button or something like this. Um, I don't agree with this format. Because it starts to assume a lot of things. So like the due to, I, it's, it assumes that something. So instead I want to, I think if you're working with this, it should be something like this. To affect like people buying our product, uh, we'll try to make a button red. Or we try to make a button blue, or we try to do something. So, but we don't assume that the, the button reason, like depending on, like of course the, a color is one easy thing, but if we do more complex stuff, uh, it's hard to like assume that this will give the, the the effect we have. So we'll try stuff on the system. Hopefully, we'll get that effect we want. And the question now comes to like, what should we measure? And for developers, I've had a lot of Twitter discussions with people about this. That like, oh, it's hard to to find the KPIs that we're looking for, or what what numbers we should we should uh, track, and what's important. And, and of course, uh, we have a name for this, and it's called Key Performance Indicators, uh, or KPIs. And like, the easiest way or to, to get them as a developer is actually, as, is actually asking the business. So the business, business people normally know what, the, what kind of important uh, indicators they use when they talk to other stakeholders or investors and stuff like that. So I actually had like... So the normal kind of stuff is if there is a business guy coming to your developers and asking, can you like run this database job to get these numbers for me? That's the KPIs normally. So that's what, what they're tracking. And some examples of this are like page views, orders created, user registered. It should be, it should be quantifiable. But it could be like minutes listened and, and stuff like that. Um, so try to find what matters to you when you start with this. And Try and start small. It's like finding those numbers that really affect the whole business. So if you're accustomed to UX people, um, there, there are a lot of other ways to talk to users or get user data. One of them is user testing or user surveys. So for those who doesn't know the difference here, uh, user testing it's actually when you take a bunch of users, put them in front of a computer, or and say like test our software. You film them, you ask them a different questions, and then they like make them solve the problems and stuff like that. And 
of course, these tools can be great for certain things, but not for this A-B testing driven development kind of stuff. Because as I said, we are biased when we make decisions. So if you come and ask a user a, a lot of questions, they are very biased as well. And the situation will make them biased. Over. So they will lie to you even though they don't think they're lying. So they will be like, oh, this looks good, but no, they won't never use it. And so <clears throat> we had this happen to us as well. So uh, one day we got like this email, oh, you're, you're playing, your ads are playing offensively loud. I will stop using your site. So we, so we got a lot of, like a five, five, ten of these emails. And of course, it's a big site, so it's not that big of a sample size, but still. So our stakeholders come to us like, we need to, uh, we need to fix this. This is not good. So we, uh, we, uh, we did A-B testing, of course, as we should do. So we did uh, two tests. So one that we actually took the, the ad volume and we muted it. And when, then we took one where we actually took the, the ad volume and, and lowered it by 50%. So we had like, it's, it's, it's still lower, but it, it's still there. Um, and of course, we're on the A-B test. So let's raise hands again. So who thinks like the muted one did better? Okay, a couple of, how, how many people think that the, like, the 50% did better? How many people think that the loud one did better? Oh, very few people that were there. Yeah, the loud one did l much better. So even though the, the users actually mailed in and complained that the volume was too loud, when we put down the volume, they actually stopped viewing videos. So the video viewing went down when we muted the video. So they, their engagement actually was in the reverse of what they actually was, was thinking. Of course, if you like, leave your volume too loud, then it's, it's going to be annoying. But most people ad adapted and actually got more like, oh, this is a video, I can watch this, and, and started to clicking and, and seeing more videos. So as I said, users have a tendency to lie to you, even though they don't know it. So it's more what they do than what they say. But still, uh, user testing can be useful, for, especially for discovering new, new stuff to do, but, but not for, for making decisions. And then, of course, we have optimizers as well, um, just to get those off the tables. So there is like Optimizely, Optimizer, Google has something. Uh, they're great, probably, for, for, for their thing, but they have a tendency to create silos. So they normally put like the, the A-B testing in the hands of the business or the content creators and stuff like that, not in the hands of the developers. And normally, they are only your layered. So you can only use it for, for changing the UIs. Um, and you want to be able to like change algorithms behind and, and do other kind of uh, A-B test testing stuff. So, of course, you can use them. It's an easy way to start with this kind of thing. But, um, so, yeah, and all, yeah, it's good to know that they're out there. But uh, I wouldn't, if you're going to do this the right way, don't start there. So let's get into the statistic part. So as I said before, uh, we have control and variation. So control is the group that has like the, the software that's running now. And the variation is the new version that we want to be running in the future, so to speak. So when I went to university, I had a statistic class and I had this professor. Uh, so he used the metaphor that you have an urn, and the urn is filled with small balls, and you have red balls, and you have white balls, and he would pull balls, and this urn had a lot of different properties, like it was infinite and stuff like that. But So I'm, I'm going to try this on you. Uh, he failed miserably. I think it was like five people who, uh, who passed the course. Uh, I was one of them, of course, but, but let's try it. But I'm going to do things a little bit different, hopefully, to make this make sense, because uh, I'm still processing how this works, uh, and, and it's a lot of things to keep in mind. But let's say we have an urn, and we have a lot of balls in it. And we can pick up a ball, and we can look at the backside, and it will be a number. And we know like the number should be about between 0 and 100 something. We don't know, but it could be. So let's, like, we pull five balls. And so... This, let's say this is a user group, so they, it's number of times they've clicked our red button. So what we can say about this little group is like, okay, so we probably will, they have clicked the difference, so if we will summarize this, we'll need to have the mean of how many, what's like the, the mean of the, 
the number of ticks we have on this group. So this will be about 18. So we have we we add these numbers and we divide them in the number we have. Simple math. So let's see we have we pull those balls and we make them one bigger balls and we want to we want to drop them down here on this um, this line depending on what number what mean they have. So let's it could look something like this. So I will pull a lot of balls and I will place them out and it will end up something like this. Uh, and this is very useful to think about because this is how your users will distribute. So depending on, let's say, how, like, this could be like the number of orders they've done. So you can actually, if you pick up the users and look at them, you will have the distribution. So normally, you, so if you have this math again, like you, what the you usually will do is like you will take everyone and just to take the mean and say like normal. Normally we have like five users, uh, or we do five orders per user or something like that. Um, so we distribute them like this, and the math guys or the statistic guys, they will actually say like, oh, this is a, this looks like this. So this is a normal curve. Everything is evened out. So it's a normal distribution. There are other types of distribution, uh, but in statistics, mostly normal distributions are what's used when they're when they're doing the math. And so we have the mean. So more or less we have like the middle part of this. So something here. So we know where the middle is. Um, but now we now need to know, like if I pick up a ball, like say I do a variation now, and I pick up that ball and I look at it, is it like is it a part of this normal distribution? Because if it's if it's part of normal distribution, I don't know if it's a change or not a change. So now we need to know like what where are the extremes? So we know that we know to know the standard deviation. So we need to know like where is how far is it out here to here? So in this case we have about like from here, it should be about uh, 30 standard deviation. That's so we can pick a ball. So if it's 30 apart, it's actually still a part of the normal distribution. So it's actually statistically not significant that if we pull like something that's in this kind of area, so it's like 35, it's it's still it's still a probability that it's the same as the control group. So. Now the question comes like how certain do we want to be because in statistics you will never be 100% because it's it, it's still a, like a forecast it's still guessing. Um so uh 90 like the normal number you see out there is about 95% and it depends on how many users you have. Uh, I will go into that deeper later. But let's say we want to be about 95% certain that what we're what we're looking at is actually true or not true if it's as change or not a change, because that's what we're after in this a big testing kind of case. So let's say we introduce like two urns. So one with white balls, that's the control group, and then one with uh, uh, red balls, that's the variations. So of course we're gonna like pull out the control group, and we're gonna distribute it. So now we need to figure out like will this when we pull out uh, a variation ball. Will it be like in the 95% population of other balls? So if we come inside the lines, so if we go back to the, yeah, okay, I'm not going to go back. But let's say we have the normal distributed curve. If it's like on the ends of those curves, it's actually okay because we can we think that that's probably a change because if we add more balls and it's starting to go outside, we know that the distribution will change and our deviations will change, and we have actually changed the distribution of our users. So let's say if we pull out two balls and they are like the, either on that side and this side, uh, we know that the variation is probably a change from the normal control group. So we actually managed to have a user behavior change, and that's what, what we want to know. And to make this even more difficult, so of course, we can pull our balls and see if they're, they're outside our standard deviation. So if they are, they were probably in the right direction. But if we just pull out one ball and like, okay, so this uh, control group, it's like one user has clicked like 60 times. Yeah, it could be, but if I like pull the other one, what's like, it could like say five. So we, we could still be in the distribution, even though one, one ball is way off. And to, uh, to look at that, we need to be more confident. And to get confidence, it's uh, advanced mathematical calculations, but I will try to exemplify this instead. So let's say we have a sample group of 1,000 users. And 
we have a control group that about 99 of them have clicked the button. And in the variation group, we have 100 people who click the button. There is a 1% change. Uh, so if, it's, it, if we would have a bigger change here, so let's say we will have a 50% change, that will probably be, we will be pretty certain that this is a significant change because it, the change is so big in itself. But 1%, it's, it's small. So the confidence we have in this number due to this small control group is like 53%. So this, it's still very r random. So we can't trust that this variation group is a good group. It could be either way. And let's say we, we, uh, we 10x it. So we have a sample size of about 10,000. And again, we have a control group that's 990 and one that's 1,000. So still 1% 1 change. So the change is the same. But now we're starting to be a bit more confident, but still, it's still like rolling the dice. It's still like 50, 60%. So of course, it's better than like the betting on black or red at a roulette table, but it's, it's still not good. But if we go out to about 100,000, uh, we will get the control. Yeah, and we still have our 1% change. So it's still the same change. Um, we now get a confidence level of like 77. So it's, it's still good. So now we actually start to see like, yeah, this change is prob probably true. So if we will release this feature, uh, it's a 77% chance that you actually will have an increased number of button clicks uh, compared to our control group. But if we can go even higher, so let's say we go up to 1 million. It's a big sample size. But if you manage to have that 1% change, will be a 99% confidence level. So you can be more or less certain that 1% change in a 1 million population will be a certainty. And that's why like big giants like Google can run those very, very small tests because they have so big sample sizes. So just a little change in how many people that clicks will actually generate, will be true for that user behavior. <coughs> So, <clears throat> this leads us in, I don't know, um, I'm guessing you've heard like all the, the Kanban and Agile kind of coaches, it's like, oh, quality first, so, I've got, and so I will say like, no, you should go quantity first. So when you're doing A-B testing, you want it big, like you want as much data as you can, because you, as, I, as you saw in the, in the calculations, the more data we have, the better decisions we can make, the more certainty we can be, the more confidence we can have that the things we're doing matter. So how do you get more quantity? So of course you can do larger test groups, so you can go about the biggest test group you can have is 50% because you need to have a control group and that needs to be 50%, so it need, needs to be comparable. Uh, of course then you can just run one test, uh, but if you're a startup or don't have that much data, uh, you can start maybe doing that. At least you can have one, one A-B test. Um, but another thing you can do is actually run it over a longer time. Because the longer time you have, the more users you accumulate, the more user behavior you can watch. Um, so that's one easy way too. And one technique you can use is actually map the whole user journey. So because the user journey starts long before uh, the user starts, or sorry, where, before they actually visit your site. Uh, so you can actually start to testing like doing ads, landing pages, uh, and of course there's a whole business around this. It's called uh, content marketing, and that's what they do. They actually A/B test like before the, in the start of the user journey, um, and you can actually use effect mapping to just just find where can I use data points so I can uh, try to build these like find these user behaviors. And <coughs> sorry. So another contradictory thing, though, is that context matters. Um, so even though you think you have a large data set, you sometimes actually need to look at it in a smaller way. So you, do you remember the, the site that we did, like, like the black and white site? We actually drilled down in that. So we actually looked in the, the mobile version, the tablet version, and, and the desktop version. So if we added them together, of course, there were no user change. But we started actually to look at the tablet version. And the tablet version actually did a 5% uh, increase in the user behavior. So it's, very, it's important to have uh, context awareness, to know that your 
your application is running for different kind of, of use, like mobile devices and stuff like that. So it's, it can have an effect, and you want to watch that as well, because if the, the change is actually bigger on that device, you can actually statistically say that. So I, I, like this case, we have like, even though we just looked at smaller sets of data, the change was so big, we actually statistically could say like the new site actually worked better than the old site for the tablet users. But it does, didn't affect the mobile or the desktop users. So all of this, it's, it's not about being right. It's about learning to make better decisions. Or everything I'm talking about here. So it's, it's like, of course, it's fun to be right, to say, like, oh, I picked the, the red button, and of course it won. <laughs> Hooray me. Uh, but it's, it's just random. We're fooled by randomness, as I said. So it's about to make, better, it's about to make learning to make better decisions. So <clears throat> let's get into the technical parts. Um, of course, we wanna want to get started on this want to code something. Um, so we can use the naive approach. And this is one approach I've, I've used in the beginning or looked at. Um, and this is, it looks normally something like this. So we have um, a feature switch that more or less like draws a, a lot of tickets, saying like, OK, this user, should, it, should he or she get uh, this feature, this new cool feature that we're doing? And of course, yes, yeah, so we said, like, if you get a lot of number, but like, like lower than 11, we will give you this feature. Um, and this will uh, lead to a lot of interesting problems. Like, now you need to track um, if, this use, if the user got that feature. So you need to, when they click the button, you need to add the event saying, like, oh, this user will got, like, the feature A or feature B. Uh, or you're... you're uh, um, and you need to like so if we want to track this. So if in your in your program later on you need to like how does this test went, you need to check the like the event flag for just this feature. Um, that's something we like to get away from because if there is a lot of if you want to bundle like a, a full approach in one feature, it's harder to do. And there's a lot other lo problems with this as well. Um, so one thing is, yeah, so, so if we look like if the, the user has checked out, you need to track like all the different kind of at, like features they had got before they went to that, to that point in time. So we actually went with another approach. Uh, I call it divide and conquer. So what we do is we take all users we have and we assign them a number. Uh, of course, the easiest way is to assign them a number between 1 and 100. Uh, and we try to just randomly distribute them uh, across every user. Um, so all buckets, and we call them buckets, so user will get in one bucket, so bucket one to 100, and all buckets are unique, and that's very important to, uh, to recognize. So there is not a bucket like another bucket. They are all very unique in their own little unique way. Uh, but we all always want to have at least one un untouched control group. So depending on how, how, how big your groups, because if you divide them in 100, normally, like, even for like, a large newspaper in Sweden, 1% one or 1% one, one is too small to make decisions on. Uh, so you probably will go up to about 5 or 10. Of course, if you work in a larger company, you can do 1%. Uh, but like 5 or 10 is a good start, starting point. So you need to have 5 or 10% uh, group that's not touched, that people don't put A-B tests on, that's always on, is on the, like, the version that we're not testing, the stable version, so to speak. And of course, you should always track the bucket ID. So you need to track like, which bucket the users are in. So instead of the naive approach, we actually need to track features. The only thing we track here is time, of course, uh, but also the, the bucket ID. So we can say, like, if you are in bucket 1, Today, you will get, we know that you will get this test or that test. Uh, so, in, in, so instead of tracking what features we, like the users are, uh, are getting, we're tracking like on the, in, on the other way around. So what our statistical group, number one, what's, what kind of test do they get? And it could look like, it's very simple code actually get, to get this work. So you can actually just, if you want to write it in JavaScript on your front end, you can do something like this. So you can assign a bucket. Uh, so we check the, 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 our cookie, so if you have a bucket cookie, 
uh, you will you not get a new number. Uh, and then we add a, a bucket cookie, and in this case also we will we want to set an expiration date on it, because we actually want people to move from buckets, so we don't get like one super bucket, where all the like users who click on red buttons are. We want them to move around in a slow manner. Like so, if you do like two two weeks iterations of te like checking your test, then um, then you probably will have like two weeks or or uh, four weeks or something like that. So not too far, not a year. So you don't want the same users to be caught in the same uh, user group in the year. So you want some kind of movement in, in your groups, but not too fast, not too much. Um, it also helps like to to view your your buckets in a more like generic way that that you don't have your favorite bucket or something like that. So um, and of course uh, you can put so if you're depending on how your site looks, if you you can put this in your uh, fire sorry in your uh, load balancer stuff like that or if you use Akamai you can actually program Akamai to actually add this cookie before the request reaches your, your servers. So you can actually have always ensure that this cookie is there for your users. But of course, you can always use this front-end stuff. And this can, if you're do using Node or even what back-end setting, setting and getting cookies are, are easy. And then you just need to check to say like, oh, okay, so should I show this, uh, um, this new cool feature? Uh, the only thing we check is like, are you inside like the bucket IDs that we have assigned? So it becomes much easier for the developers. So instead of like I need to have a key value that's the name of my feature uh, that I need to s to store somewhere, the only thing I say is like, oh, I want to run an A/B test, and I want it to go from like, okay, so I need to run a new one, so I want it to go from 11 to 15 or 11 to 20, depending on how large group I want. So I can choose how many users, just writing depending on how many, how big, like the value of the cookie. Uh, so it, it's very easy as a developer to just spin up new A-B tests depending on uh, these, these buckets. I don't need to track features. I don't need to know anything about the system around me, uh, except other A-B tests, of course, but I'll go into that later. But, and of course, if you just use Google Analytics, uh, you can set dimensions. So the only little code snippet you actually need to get this working on your site today is the, this one, and it will track in Google Analytics, and then in Google Analytics, you can actually go in and say, I want to have my page views for the, the, the users in dimension five that has the value one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, of course. So, when you have, as I said, when you have this up and running, of course, you want to have dashboards or something, something to look at, because we actually we have, we have now the code that will tell the user, like, this is the new code, and now we need a way to visualize this. And of course, we have like this, this view in front of us. So it's actually from, from work. Uh, uh, this is not the A-B testing dashboards. Uh, <laughs> but of course, uh, a lot of dashboards are very, very complicated or advanced. And if you wanted to succeed with this, you need a dashboard that looks like this, more or less. So that's more or less the dashboard we're, we're looking at. So just simple KPIs and the difference from the variation and the control group. And we actually started, so when we, so the workflow we set up was that when we released a new feature, the first thing we did like the day after was actually checking the numbers to see that if the difference was very big, we can actually see if our code was broken. Uh, because normally we just will see just small changes if we like change the color of a button or a new feature. But another view that we found useful, uh, mostly because of morale, was this one. So just tracking to see how like your KPIs are going through time. So a histogram, in sort. It doesn't need to be more advanced than this. So we actually had this in the top, and this in the bottom. And so this helps us make decisions. This just helps us feel good about what we were doing, because we can actually see over time that we were improving. And as I said before, you need to track all tests, because if, you, if two groups of developers actually uh, entangle their tests in the same uh, test group, you will have uh, faulty data, of course. 
So we just have a simple spreadsheet. It looks something like this. So we have the red button test. So we see the variation group and the new tablet version or random recommended or blue button. <coughs> So another thing when we all have all this set up that we can do is negative testing. And, and this becomes, so when you start to get used to this, like we do A-B testing and, and things are going good and, and sometimes nothing happens and you get like, it's not fun, but, but now we can actually do some, something that we want to start to work on a new feature. So we actually had like a new recommendation engine we, we thought of, like should we spend a lot of development hours building this new cool like recommendation engine depending on this cool algorithms and stuff like that. So we already had an al algorithm. It looks something like this. So it's, that's this algorithm here that picks out like the recommended videos for this, this video. Uh, so what we did, did actually, before we actually did some cool development where our, the, the machine learning guys had to do their, their magic, uh, we actually said, like, what if we give, give these guys random stuff, just randomly selected videos, because that should perform, if this, kind of, if this feature matter, um, uh, it would perform worse, because we, we're giving them shit. Like, we just give them random stuff. It shouldn't be... Like they, should, they shouldn't be affected. They should be affected by that if they're using this feature. So that's what we did. So we actually gave them like random vid selected videos, and the the interesting part is like there were no effect at all. The KPIs actually said nothing. So we actually we didn't do any development on this. We actually went on and do other stuff. Uh, but with but. But of course, we couldn't left. We were, we were curious guys, so we couldn't leave it at that. So we actually built in so just click tracking to see if we can see if people just clicked those links here. And what, actually, what we could see, of course, the random stuff did do worse for the for the users that actually clicked the recommended videos. But there are so few people clicking the recommended videos; it actually had didn't, didn't have no effect on the KPIs. So it's an interesting t technique you can do when you're actually starting to build up this momentum. And that's actually making you, so that made us make better decisions. So we, instead of like spending a lot of ML time, like for maybe 1% of new user, uh, we actually can do a lot of other fun stuff that actually gave more user experience, a better user experience. So all of this sounds wonderful, right? Uh, but it will go wrong. Uh, that's. It's always go wrong um, in different kind of ways. But I think like the biggest thing that will go wrong is this one. No one uses the data to make decisions. And of course, this is more of an experience I've had from other places. Like we gather a lot of data, we buy expensive like as software to track all, all the data we have, or we can make cool queries and stuff like that. But <coughs> nobody uses it. Like maybe some guy comes like once uh, once a quarter, like oh, I need this report, um, but it should be used by the developers all the time, and of course focusing on the wrong metrics um, is uh, a danger as well, um, and badly named data is something I've I've encountered a lot of. Like it says something, but it's something else, and you, so you make a decision based on that naming, and it's then you actually are making decisions on other kind of type of data. So name your data correctly. And not accounting for population size uh, is one problem I've seen as well. So that when I s said population size, so <coughs> let's say we, 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 we were doing an A-B test and we let just take the, the control number. So the, this, looks like, this looks like a very good test. So the variation is like way bigger than the first one. But if we don't take into account the population size. So in this case, the number of users or the number of user sessions. This looks very good, but when we calculate, like the, when we take the the page views divided by number of users, so the, this, uh, so that number will be the the same, the, depend, independent of how the big the control group is. And then we get the variation; it's lower. Sorry. So it means that even though the the number is bigger, if we don't take in the number of users or number of sessions we have, the, dot, the, data, the, the decision we will make will be all wrong. So it's very important to normally always divide your 
your like numbers, like page views, button clicks, orders is created by the number of users you have or by the number of user sessions. That will give you a much better view of how to make decisions. And another part, as I said, like the bigger you want your size as bigger, big as possible. Um, sampling is actually doing the opposite; it's actually taking it smaller. And of course, like Google tries, to, Google Analytics tries to push this because it's easier for them to calculate. And of course, if you do it on all your users, that's that's probably probably pretty good to do because you save a lot of computing. But what when when you do like on smaller parts, actually sampling becomes something that gives you either either worse results. So try to, just so you know, a lot of systems do that. So try to avoid it. And of course, working with the wrong significance metric. So you should put in a little bit of time um, to just check your significance metrics to see if the variations you have are within the, your control group. So one thing you can always do, that's, uh, that's a fun trick, is just if you don't have if you only have control groups and you take like 5% and just another 5% and you compare them, uh, you will see that you will have a difference between the same code or the same features. Um, so you can start by there by checking. Another thing is that your code is broken, of course. But that's a good thing. So if, you're, if your tracking is broken because your code is broken, you can normally see that in your, in your statistics. And then you can actually go fix your code. So that's pretty nice. Um, but this is one that's more, most, more common, that your tracking is broken, because people don't test their tracking. And it's pretty hard to test your tracking, because you're testing actually something that's outside your system. Um, and one technique uh, that I tried um, that you can use if you want to do that is proxy testing. So you actually run up a proxy that will fake uh, or analyze the data uh, from your network. And, pro and the, the, the stack I've been looking at is this. So you have WebDriver or Selenium, depending on how you want to name it. Uh, and there is a product called Browser Mob Proxy that will actually spawn up a new proxy, and you can actually say to it, start a new proxy, uh, and then uh, you can run data traffic through that, and it will, will analyze it for you. And of course, your favorite testing framework. So what does this testing do? So what it does, it's actually going through your network uh, view, and it will actually can and so what you will do is you will get a JSON blob that will represent everything you see here. And it can actually go in and say, like, you can first check, like, oh, is there an analytics file on my, my site? Because it should be, because else I'm not running my analytics software. And then you can actually go in and check, like, is it sending the right user data? Is it having the right buckets? Is it, does it, do we send all the things we need to make decisions? And the code can look something like this. So we start our here. So we just do this kind of Selenium kind of thing where we start a client and we say, like, yeah, go to my blog and check if the title is the title. So that's pretty standard for Selenium kind of stuff. But then we actually get this proxy back. So what we with this har file. And we parse it into JSON and then we can say, like, oh, does it does the do we have any entry where the request of the earliest analytics? Yes, we have. And then we know that. At least we have a test that can check if our analytics are there. And of course, we can go deeper in this data. We can assure that the bucket ID is set, that the category that we're using are set, or what we are using. And of course, we can check our events as well, so if we do a click or a start or something like that. And always assume something's wrong. If you get like either happy, happy numbers or very sad numbers, something is normally wrong, because the normal curve for change, especially in a bigger system, is very flat. It's, like, it's small, it's incremental, it's not like big. You won't see 10% up or 10% down. You'll probably see like 1%, 2% in the beginning. And of course, you should continuously improve your tracking system. And one way to do it, of course, is introduce another tracking system to check, to verify the data. Uh, sadly enough, uh, that's, some, that's something we had to do, and we have actually seen that some tracking systems do things wrong. Um, uh, so it's not even in our code, it's actually in their code. So it's obviously always good to have double verification of the things you're doing. So let's wrap this up. But even though we want to be data-driven, and of course we're, we're scientific and we like that stuff, um, religion or subjectivity will always drive science or A-B tests. So there will always be some kind of, of 
person or idea or that will drive what kind of A-B test will we do today. So that's something that A-B test can never help you with. What should you test next? Uh, it can only like, say if like, the test you're doing is good or bad for the thing you will want to reach. So, but, as I said, focus on user behavior. Th that's the thing we want to change. Locate your KPIs, talk to your business, find out what the important numbers are. Uh, of course, you can actually make up your own KPIs in the, the domain you are working with. Of do that. It's better to have that than nothing. And of course, divide and conquer your us users into small buckets. Quantify everything. So, quanti sorry, qu yeah, quantity first, sorry. So more, get more data in any way you can to make better decisions. And of course, be context aware when you can. And try to make this a part, if you want to succeed with this, you ha really have to make this a part of your daily routine. So if you have a stand up, like one of the things you should actually say or go through is like, what are the A-B tests running today? How are they doing? Are they correct? Are they working as the ads? Can we see something? Can we make decisions on them? So make bet better decisions. And of course, fuel your cu curiosity, because like, this is pretty much fun to actually try, like, oh, does this work on the user, or does this work on the user? This is actually, so like, try to use this as a fuel to try out and test new things. Um, so just to iterate, the last part. So this is about A-B test-driven development. I hope you get a chance to try it out, because it's, it's ver a very fun way to work. Uh, and it's something I highly recommend. And of course, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. Um, <laughs> and last of all, I want to just mention Expressum development team that has approved that I can use this material. Um, I, I'm guessing they're hiring, so if you're looking for a job in Sweden, I can highly recommend working there. So with that, s stay humble, be brave, do cool stuff, and hopefully I will see you around here in the conference area. So that's all for me. Thank you very much.